having considered the call of the man of God to the pastoral office, the life of that man in that office, then his labor in preaching and in overseeing the flock of God, we are now in this fifth major category of ministerial responsibility, namely the pastor as an intercessor for the people of God. In our initial study last week, we were directed to consider the duty of ministerial intercessory prayer and then briefly the dominant concerns of ministerial intercessory prayer. Now, if the duty is so clearly established from the precepts and from the precedents of Scripture, and if the concerns are so central to the success of the ministry, why is it so difficult both to attain and maintain any level of consistency in this duty. And any man who is honest with his own heart and honest with his brethren will acknowledge that perhaps there is no area of ministerial responsibility in which it is more difficult to maintain a semblance of true fidelity. And so, as ugly as it is to look into the sinkhole of our own hearts that contribute to this, we must take up today the major hindrances to ministerial intercessory prayer. It's listed in your notes as unit number three, the major hindrances. And in seeking to handle the material, we're going to take up three major categories of the hindrances, then some suggestions to counteract the hindrances, and then as time permits, a fifth category of two miscellaneous concerns relative to ministerial intercessory prayer. Now, my judgment is that the hindrances fall into three broad categories, and while there is some overlapping and interpenetration between them, I trust for the ends of edification, isolating them and identifying them in these three categories will prove helpful to you men. And the categories are theological hindrances, spiritual hindrances, and practical hindrances. Under the theological, I've named two. First of all, a defective theology of prayer in relationship to the divine purpose and will. I think all of us, I would be surprised if not all of us, can remember when we first began to come to grips at some cognitive level with the biblical doctrine of the divine decrees or the biblical doctrine of comprehensive predestination that we did not experience some real trauma when we began to wrestle with the relationship of prayer to the divine decrees. For some, we may have wrestled with the whole issue of if God has a people and he's chosen them, Christ has died to redeem them, and the Spirit as the executor of the will of the Father and the Son will infallibly call them what is the place of preaching along with the place of praying. And I think most of us found that the why preach question was easier to resolve. And I think it was easier to resolve because we can see more readily the relationship between preaching and the calling of God's elect. The Lord Jesus said in John 10:16, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, one shepherd. And we know from Romans 10, 13 and following, that the voice of Christ is heard in the proclamation of the word of Christ. And likewise, with respect to the maturation of the saints, we know that our Lord prays, sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. Ephesians 4, verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. But in preaching, that's an activity that we do in God's name and on behalf of God that has a manward direction. We preach to men confident that God will bless his word to the calling of the sheep for whom Christ died. However, when we pray, this is a heavenward activity. This is an activity in which we are seeking to secure the help and the intervention of God on behalf of others. We are not standing as the instrument of God bringing his word to others, but we're standing before God on behalf of others pleading with him to do things in the hearts of men. And as far as I'm concerned, at the end of the day, whatever penetrating insights God may give us from the Word, 
with respect to this whole question of what is the relationship between the prayers of the people of God and the actings of a sovereign God to whom his works are known, the end from the beginning, we've got to come to the simplicity of childlike faith in the explicit statements of the word of God. When we come to a passage like James 4, 2, we need to take it at face value. You have not because you ask not. And there the impoverished state of the believer is laid at the feet of his own prayerlessness. Now ultimately the decree of God has not been, as it were, thrown off even in the failures of the child of God. But James does not say you have not because it was decreed that you should be in that state of impoverishment. He says you have not because you ask not. From the positive perspective, the words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. No parenthetical statements, if indeed it has been decreed from all eternity. Seek, and ye shall find, parenthesis, if indeed you seek what has been decreed. Ask, seek, knock, and there is the explicit promise that to our asking God gives. To our seeking we shall find, to our knocking it shall be opened. Or take that broad promise of our Lord in Matthew 18, 19. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching the things they ask, it shall be given of my Father. And then the encouragement of our Lord in the two dominant parables on prayer in Luke 11 and Luke 18, underscoring the place of importunity, holy insistence in our praying. And then the Lord's statement in Mark 9.29, This kind goes not out but by prayer. And at the end of the day, I think we need to see the whole operations of the kingdom of God in its advancement in the conversion of sinners, in the building up of saints, in terms of the very law of the kingdom to which Messiah himself has subjected himself. I will tell of the decree I will tell of the decree, we are told in Psalm 2, so that whatever is promised to Messiah is rooted in divine decree. I will tell of the decree. And what is the decree? Here it is. The Lord said unto me, You are my son, this day have I begotten you, that is, begotten you to your place of messianic kingship and exaltation. And in that place, what is he to do? Rest upon my decree? No. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Messiah must ask for the very thing it is decreed to give him. And if Messiah must ask, how much more the servants of Messiah? And therefore, any view of prayer that is biblical is one in which our dealings with God will be intensely personal, honest, earnest, bold, and believing. We do not pretend that we can sort out precisely how our prayers are woven into the texture of God's decree and the outworking of His sovereign purposes. But we can know that He has said to us in Christ, Ask, and it shall be given you and be unashamed to ask with the insistence of the friend who came to his friend at midnight and was not turned away when he had a first refusal. Our Lord is doing that to encourage us to ask. Now, there are all kinds of real problems in conjunction with the asking. And I'm as aware of those problems as you are. And the older you get, your basket of problems will get bigger. But we must never allow the problems connected with prayer to take away from us that childlike, simple confidence in the word and promise that God has given us in the Scriptures. And so, often, theological problems lie at the root of failure to be tenacious in pastoral, ministerial intercession because, though we would theoretically deny that we have a problem of the relationship between prayer and the sovereignty of God or the decree of God, in reality we have allowed something to be short-circuited. And if we have in our blessed Lord, in the perfection of His humanity, examples of wrestling and even asking for something that it was not the will of the Father to give, we should never be embarrassed that we may be asking for things 
that it's not the Father's will to give. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And he prayed it not only once, but he went back again and prayed the same words a second time. So in our Lord, we have the example of one who comes to that which was decreed on his behalf by means of asking, and we have in that example of our Lord one who asks for something it was not the will of God to give. And he did so without sin. And this should free us up from any sense of bondage that we are somehow seeking to alter by our feeble cries what God has purposed in his eternal decree. The rule of our prayers is to be the promises and the precepts of Scripture as with the rule of our walking while confident behind all of this God is taking care of his affairs. And we don't view prayer as getting God in a hammerlock that he will go back and erase some things in the book of his own eternal decree because we pushed him hard enough and we got him to cry uncle. Mm -hmm. That's a pagan concept of prayer. But neither do we fall into a de facto hyper-Calvinistic kind of prayer in which we only view prayer in terms of its subjective influence upon our own hearts. Not knowing the mind of God with respect to who he has set his love upon from eternity, we are warranted to pray for all kinds of men. In loving our neighbor, we are to desire the salvation of every one of them and to express that desire in our prayers. And at the point of our prayers, it's as though the doctrine of election is not even known to us. Does that sound like a contradiction? I hope not. There are times in our prayers when the doctrine of election will be at the forefront of our prayers. When we will be praying with confidence, Lord, we know that you will call out your own. But there are other times when praying for specific individuals, we have no way of knowing what God has decreed. And God is not pleased, God is not displeased when we plead with Him out of a heart suffused with something of His own love for people who may ultimately prove to be non-elect and reprobate. God will never dis be displeased because we prayed for them. So brethren, I would urge you not to let yourself at any point in your Christian experience allow your mind to go into any field of, of rationalizing that will take away your delight to take the promises of God and press them before Him with earnestness when you pray. A defective theology of prayer in relationship to the divine purpose and will can cut the nerve of consistency and passion in intercessory prayer. But then secondly, a defective theology of prayer in relationship to the other revealed duties of the ministry. I trust that each of us is convinced that accurate, clear, earnest proclamation of biblical truth is an indispensable part of ministerial duty. If I were to question each of you men one by one, how many of you believe that accurate, clear, earnest proclamation of biblical truth is a negotiable duty of the Christian ministry? I hope each of you would say, no, non-negotiable. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your utmost. Spudazzo. Do your utmost to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, cutting a straight course in the word of truth. We believe that the admonition and charge of Paul to Timothy rests upon every servant of God in 2 Timothy 4.4. 4. Preach the word. Preach the word. That's our duty. Non-negotiable. And we are convinced in a, the theater of our consciences if we fail to do this, we incur real guilt. And we must seek forgiveness and bring forth fruits meet for repentance. Furthermore, I trust we're all convinced that biblically grounded, loving, patient, and impartial direction and oversight of the people of God is an indispensable duty of the Christian ministry. We believe, Acts 20:28. 20, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. We believe the injunction of Peter in 1 Peter 5 rests upon us, non-negotiable. The elders among you I exhort, shepherd, tend the flock of God, not of constraint, but of a ready mind, not as lording it over God's heritage, but making yourselves examples to the flock. And if we fail to do that, 
we have a conscience that would smite us, and we know we've incurred guilt for which we need to seek forgiveness, and from the Spirit of God seek grace to reform in those areas of deficiency. However, a great hindrance to consistency in pastoral intercession is that we develop a false theology which has parallels to the doctrine of the carnal Christian. You see, in the doctrine of the carnal Christian, we say we must acknowledge our own sinfulness to be a Christian. That's essential. We must rest solely in what Christ has done for sinners as of the very essence of saving faith. However, following the profession of acknowledged sin and faith in Christ, a life of holiness is desirable, <coughs> commendable, but optional. I've never met anyone who holds the doctrine of the carnal Christian that would not say, well, holiness is desirable, and it is commendable, but it is not essential. It's ideal, but not necessary. Not necessary to the attainment of life. They have an unconditional security. Once saved, always saved, no matter what you do. Now, it's better if you do that which pleases God. You'll get more yo-yos in your bag at the last day. You'll be happier on your way to get your bag of yo-yos. But you'll still get there. Third class citizen, but you'll get there. And brethren, we can adopt a kind of carnal Christian doctrine with regard to intercessory prayer. We would not deny that it is desirable, commendable, and ideal. But we must put it in the same category with clear, biblical, accurate, spirit-anointed preaching and wise, loving, discerning, responsible, pastoral oversight. We must place intercessory prayer in the same category as an indispensable, non-negotiable duty of the work of the ministry. And if we put it in any other category, we're going to fail in it again and again and again. The same way, under the pressure of some of your fiercest temptations, if you believe the carnal Christian doctrine and did not say to yourself, what is now proposed to my mind, to follow that is to unravel all hope that I'm a child of God and put myself on the high road to apostasy. That hand must be cut off. If it isn't, it'll burn in hell. That's the motivation Jesus gives. And there are times when it's that motivation that draws us in because we know holiness is not optional. We pursue it without which we know no man shall see God. Well, in the same way, if we're to load shot against the tendency to be slipshod and careless and inconsistent in ministerial prayer, we must have a theology of that duty and privilege in which we regard failure in it as nothing short of sin. And that's why I've listed 1 Samuel 12:23 as perhaps the clearest text in all of Scripture with respect to this matter. You remember that the man of God has expostulated with the people regarding their desire to have a king. And now he comes in his final solemn address to the people and we read in verse 19 and all the people said unto Samuel pray for your servants unto the Lord your God that we die not for we've added unto all our sins this evil to ask a king for ourselves and Samuel said unto the people fear not you have indeed done all this evil yet turn not aside from following the Lord but serve the Lord with all your heart and turn not aside, for then you would go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people unto himself. Now here is a statement of the absolute certainty of God's continued favor to his chosen people. The Lord will not forsake his people. Why? for the protection of his own name, for his own name's sake, because it pleased the Lord to make you a people to himself. Here he has absolute confidence that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. But look at his next statement. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You see the conjunction of those things? Absolute certainty. Absolute certainty. 
that the Lord will not forsake his people. His name is at stake. It is God who took the initiative to draw them to himself, and yet Samuel is convinced that if he does not pray for them, he will be sinning not only against them, that's implicit, but explicitly, he will be sinning against Jehovah. Sinning against God. Why? Because God had put him in a place of unique responsibility with respect to the nation. And he is not only to instruct them, and he goes right on to say that, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. But he not only instructs and admonishes and exhorts, but he commits himself to intercessory prayer on their behalf. And so I urge you, brethren, not to allow yourselves to imbibe imperceptibly a defective theology of prayer in relationship to the other revealed duties of the ministry, but load your conscience with this biblical perspective that as surely as I need the fountain open for sin and uncleanness in my failures and shortcomings in the area of public teaching and preaching, as surely as I need that fountain for my failures in oversight of the flock of God and specific pastoral involvement with them, so likewise failures in intercessory prayer make me culpable and put me in the posture where I need to go to the fountain open for sin and uncleanness and having gone, pray for grace to bring forth fruits meet for repentance. So that's the first category of the hindrances to ministerial intercessory prayer, what I've called theological hindrances. Now we come to spiritual hindrances. Those having to do not so much with the judgment of our minds, but with the dynamics of the Christian life and experience. And I've listed three of these major spiritual hindrances to ministerial intercessory prayer. And the first is what I've described as the aversion of the flesh to the intensely spiritual exercises of pastoral prayer. The aversion of the flesh to the intense spirituality of the exercise of pastoral intercessory prayer. The two texts that I've listed are familiar to you. Galatians 5.17 The flesh is lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two For these are contrary the one to the other. The flesh is lusting against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. Now this is not the two nature theory of the Christian life. That you have an old nature and a new nature and they war. And uh, the old nature can do nothing but sin. The new nature can do nothing but that which is virtuous. And you're caught somewhere as a third party outside the two natures fighting within you. No. That's not the teaching of the passage. But the passage is teaching that there is, in the believer, this irreconcilable warfare between the remnants of sin here called the flesh and the indwelling, dominating influence of the Holy Spirit. And there is this constant warfare. And an extended commentary upon this, in my judgment, standing with what I would call the classic Protestant and Reformed interpretation of Romans 7, 18 and 23 is that we have in the Romans 7 passage the expanded version of what is here declared. And Owen very perceptively underscores in his exposition of Romans 7, 21 the principle that I'm trying to highlight for you. He writes on page 161 of volume 6. Fourthly, there is another thing remaining in these words of the Apostle arising from that respect that the presence of sin has unto the time and season of duty. And then he focuses on the words, when I would do good. Evil is present with me. There are two things to be considered in the will of doing good that is in believers. Number one, there is its habitual residence in them. The prevailing disposition of a true believer is a disposition to do good. He has a commitment to a life of righteousness, Owen is saying. But then he said, secondly, there are special times and seasons for the exercise of that principle. There is a when I would do good, end quote. A season wherein this or that good, this or that duty is to be performed and accomplished suitably unto the habitual preparation and inclination of the will. 
the preparation and inclination of the will is to love your wife. Now there's a situation where she has just proven herself very unlovely. Yet you will to do the good of loving her as Christ loved you. He said, now that's a season of peculiar, intensified desire to do good. Put it into the area of our subject. The time is coming that you've allocated for ministerial intercessory prayer. You would, as a man committed to being a prayerful man, you would do the specific good of praying for those specific names in your church directory. Praying for those fellow office bearers. Whatever the thing is allocated for that time of intercession, Owen's point is that unto these two there are two things in indwelling sin opposed. It is opposed to the gracious principle residing in the will, inclining to that which is spiritually good. It is opposed, as it is a law, that is a contrary principle, inclining to evil with an aversation from that which is good. The flesh is continually lusting against the spirit. But now he says there's a second manifestation. Unto this second, or the actual willing of this or that good in particular, Unto this, when I would do good, is opposed the presence of this law. Evil is present with me. Evil is at hand and ready to oppose the actual accomplishment of the good aimed at. Whence, indwelling sin is effectually operative in rebelling and inclining to evil when the will of doing good is in a particular manner active and inclining unto obedience. And there, Owen's knowledge of the human heart is without parallel in my judgment. And then you begin to understand, why is it that there was very little consciousness of the aversion of this contrary principle when I was on the phone with a friend, having good fellowship or sharing a burden of a fellow pastor. But I look at the clock, and this is the time for intercession, and suddenly there is this dullness that creeps over the spirit. The mind begins to spit out all the things that yet need to be done, like a day planner that suddenly developed a voice of its own. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. this. None of those things were there in the previous activity. What's the explanation? Here's the explanation, the aversion of the flesh to the intense spirituality of the exercise of pastoral prayer. And that's going to be with you all your days. And I take no delight in exposing what I think is a dangerous teaching, but it needs to be done, lest some dear soul fall prey to it, or you read this and say there must be something tragically wrong with me. In chapter 20 of the doctor's expositions in Ephesians, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4, I think it is, on quenching the spirit. I'm not sure what book this is from, I'm sorry, but it's Dr. Lloyd-Jones. And he says, how do we know whether the Spirit is working in us powerfully? One test is found in the epistles of the Philippians. And then he quotes, God is at work in you to will and to do this good pleasure. God works in every Christian by and through the Spirit, the fire, the power. He prompts us, he urges us, he leads us, as Paul expresses in Romans 8.14. The Spirit produces a kind of disturbance within us, moving, urging, prompting. We are aware of a power dealing with us a power other than ourselves. Another test is that the Spirit always leads to life and vigor and liveliness. The truly spiritual man, the Christian filled with the Spirit, is never a man who has to drag himself and force himself to do things. There's a power in him, a vigor and liveliness, because the Spirit is a life-giving Spirit. The contrast drawn in Scripture between the non-Christian and the Christian is that between someone who's dead in trespasses and sins and someone who's alive from the dead, who's been born again. The non-Christian is dead, he's lifeless, he knows nothing about God, nothing about the life of the soul, nothing about a spiritual energy. He He does not live, he only exists. That's the tragedy of the world today. Everyone who is a Christian, filled with the Spirit, knows about this vigor, this liveliness, So he does not have to drive himself or urge himself or drag himself to God's house or to anything he does as a Christian. The energy of the Spirit is moving in him. And then he goes on to cite several texts that he thinks support that view. 
Well, let's allow that in trying to emphasize that there is an experiential dimension of the operations of the Spirit, which at time make it as natural as breathing to do that which is good, to state that that is the unbroken norm if you are filled with the Spirit is utterly imbalanced and out of the tenor of the total witness of the Word of God. Otherwise, the Apostle Paul could never have said what he did. When I would do good, evil is present with me. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. I buffet my body and keep it under, lest in preaching to others I myself should be a ducking horse. No, brethren, that aversion, that aversion will be there to the end of your days. And I've got a sneaking suspicion you're going to find it increases the closer you get to the river. If you wonder why the scripture and church history records so many men undoing in the latter laps of their life all they accomplished in the first laps, I believe as a man getting into his latter laps, if the devil can get someone out of the race who's run it for a long time, he's got much more fuel with which to undermine the reality and the validity of the Christian faith. And therefore, I don't expect that the warfare is going to get any less vehement and violent and vicious. But it's going to increase. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. Yes, this was his commentary in Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. I do have it in my notes. His commentary on Ephesians 6. So there is this aversion of the flesh to the intense spirituality of this exercise. Second spiritual hindrance is this. The opposition of the powers of darkness to our gaining efficiency in this exercise. Why are the powers of darkness peculiarly set on keeping a servant of God from gaining efficiency and consistency in intercessory prayer? Well, I believe the answer lies in the two texts that I've put in the notes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle writes, For though we walk in the flesh, not speaking their flesh as moral, morally reprehensible uh, activity, but we walk in the flesh, that is, men in our bodily existence, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds, casting down reasonings and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. He says we have weapons that are not fleshly, but they are mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds. And we know from the analogy of Scripture that among those weapons, none is mightier than intercessory prayer. And in Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, the Apostle tells us that our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. We are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God. And how does he conclude that exhortation? He concludes it with verse 18 and following, with all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons in the Spirit. So that in this conflict with the powers of darkness, unseen yet real powers, there is an opposition from those powers to keep us from using that weapon that is most effectual in their defeat. You remember that strange passage in Daniel chapter 10. The moment he set himself to seek the face of God, God tells him later he was heard, but there were these spiritual powers that hindered the angel from coming and bringing the assurance of the answer. And I can't explain that, brethren, but it's there in my Bible as it's there in your Bible. And surely it makes sense that if in intercessory prayer we are entering into a realm of engaging these powers and these principalities that oppose Christ and oppose his kingdom, then surely he would delight to keep us from using the weapons that are most effectual in spelling his own defeat. And we've got to recognize this. If we don't, we'll leave ourselves vulnerable, being turned aside from this privilege and duty 
and finding a semblance of some good reason to do so, not realizing that we are capitulating to the very powers of darkness that oppose us in our spiritual warfare. And then thirdly, as to a spiritual hindrance, it's what I've described as the negative influence of a grieved Holy Spirit. If the Spirit is the Spirit of grace and supplication, and He is, and if we are commanded to pray in the Spirit, and we are, Ephesians 6 and verse 18, Jude and verse 20, we are to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, keep ourselves in the love of God, and pray in the Spirit, then surely a grieved spirit is a spirit who will not, in the language of 826, we will not know his help. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmity. What infirmity? The infirmity of not knowing how to pray as we ought. Feeling the frustrations of prayer. Paul felt them. We know not how to pray as we ought. He felt the frustrations of prayer. But he says in that infirmity, the Spirit helps us. The Spirit is the one who comes alongside and, and becomes the advocate within, even as we have an advocate above and without us. But now if he is grieved, Ephesians 4.30, he is a person. And if he is grieved, by the toleration of an ethical abnormality, by the refusal to acknowledge a sin that has come into the uh, theater of our consciousness, as I sought to describe transgressions last week in opening up Proverbs 28.13, if he is grieved at the level of the ethical, do we think we can just come into the closet, flip a switch, and know his presence enabling us in prayer? We don't play games with God. You cannot, you cannot, Pick and choose the operations of the Holy Spirit that you would like to have in your present experience. And if he's grieved in area A, then his ministry in areas B, C, and D, to some extent, will be restrained in us. If there's a waning love to our people, he alone can sustain a love to our people. If we're grieving him and there's no love for our people, where will be the passion to pray for if he's the Spirit who enables us to take hold of the promises and quickens faith in our hearts, if he's grieved and there is no prayer of faith, it will be not long before there will be no prayer. Who wants to mock himself by mumbling words that he knows have no suffused life with present confidence in the promises of God? Well, brethren, these are your three great spiritual hindrances and they're going to be with you all of your days. And it is possible to have a true theology of prayer and yet be greatly hindered if we don't recognize what is the source of this aversion and know how to deal with it and to recognize the powers of darkness that are set against us to keep us from being efficient in prayer and to ask ourselves if indeed our indisposition to pray and our inability to pray with any degree of grip and liberty and utterance in the secret place is the result of a grieved Holy Spirit. And then the third category of the hindrances to ministerial intercessory prayer are what I've called practical. Not that the other perspectives aren't practical, but again, trying to put them in workable categories. And here I've listed three of them. First of all, the apparently conflicting ministerial duties and responsibilities. You see, it's relatively easy if God has enabled you to commit yourself to a life of abiding in Christ, maintaining a conscience void of offense to God and man. It's relatively easy when duty presents itself as one fork in the road and sin presents itself in the other. It's relatively easy to know what the choice ought to be and I hope by a habit of soul, increasingly easy to make the right choice to reckon yourself in union with Christ, to be dead indeed unto sin. Not to present your, inst your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but afresh presenting yourself unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness unto Him. But what's difficult is when you come to the fork in the road and it's duty and duty. And both duties are calling. And you can see that the road has been paved by the Scriptures. That's when it's difficult. And that's one of the practical difficulties in attaining and maintaining some degree of consistency in ministerial intercessory prayer is the apparent conflicting ministerial duties. If I give this much time to this, 
then my preaching will not be accurate. It will not be well structured. It will not be illustrated. It will be shabby and feathery in its applications. If I give this time to here, I'll not have the time I ought to give to my wife, to my children, to family worship, to general reading, to correspondence, to nurturing friendships. Well, I can only say that we come back to the basic issues of self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And the requirement for an elder, Titus 1.8, is he be self-controlled and must have an engrowing ability cultivated by the Word and the Spirit to differentiate between the duty that is compelling and ought to have my attention now and the duty that must wait for another time to be performed. And that's going to mean that time for prayer is going to be time cut out in the path of self-denial. And here I want to quote from Pastor Chantry's book, The Shadow of the Cross. He has some of the most helpful insights on this that I've ever read. Page 72. Self must be denied as to time and attention for prayer. All prayer cannot be wielded without the expenditure of time. A minute with God seldom lays hold of him. Sustained prayer is necessary. Such time may only be found by snatching it from personal pursuits, however legitimate they may be. Ministers of the gospel find their schedules squeezed. Families may not be forsaken in order to give time for prayer. For a well-regulated home is the prerequisite to holding the office of an elder. God's flock may not be abandoned. There are lost sheep to be sought, strange sheep to be warned, lambs to be instructed. For all these souls an account must be given. Time for study may not be surrendered. If a man's to feed the flock of God, meditation, reading, diligent search of the word is indispensable. What then will a minister, when then will a minister find time to pray? Tomorrow will offer no more leisure. The time can only be located in what the minister might call his own time. It's striking that the greatest men of prayer in history have been some of the busiest men in the world. Think of Moses forging a nation for more than two million slaves. Look at Daniel occupied with affairs of the state in Babylon. Think of Luther, professor, Bible translator, pastor, prolific writer, who prayed three hours each day. But the chief example of them all is our Lord Jesus Christ, who reserved early morning or late hours for prayer. If anyone was entitled to relax or seek refreshment, it was our Holy Master. But he used his own time to pray. It is not that we are too busy to pray, but the flesh is still too insistent on satisfaction. Days of fasting and prayer will be set aside from only one part of the calendar, yours. Days of relaxation and recreation must be shortened. Holidays must diminish. Self must be intentionally denied that we might come to our knees. How is it that ministers are too busy to be found in God's court, but somehow their holidays are still fit into their schedule? Penetrating, searching, convicting words, but true words. And so at this practical level, we must learn how to handle the apparently conflicting ministerial duties and responsibilities and in dependence upon our Lord Jesus and by the enablement of the Spirit so control the use of our time that while none of us will ever feel that we can stand on the top of the mountain and say, hey, you fellow stragglers, come up where I am, we shall be able to say at least with a measure of a good conscience that by the grace of God we have not been chronically deficient in the duty of ministerial intercession. But then the second practical hindrance is what I've described as not realistically structuring the goals for this exercise. I've already hinted at this in other contexts, but I want to underscore it again. With reference to the amount of time, the scope of concerns covered, and the level of spiritual energy to give yourself to that time and those issues, you must not set realistic standards. This is one of the snares of reading the biographies of men who were mighty in prayer and could pray for two and three, four hours and say, all right, Lord, I'm going to start praying intercessory prayer for at least an hour a day. 
And after 15 to 20 minutes, you're all prayed out, and now you look at your clock, and what happens? You either come to the conclusion you made an unrealistic goal, or you load yourself with more guilt. And when you're laden down with the guilt, what does that do to any excitement about coming to pray tomorrow? It cuts the nerve of it. And as in all other spiritual disciplines, we must be realistic in structuring the goals to develop in this area. So with respect to the amount of things to be covered and the amount of time given, don't be like all the out of shape people who see a, a, a TV program on the place of good cardiovascular exercise and avoiding so many physical ills, and they haven't walked a half a mile in 20 years, let alone run, and they go out and buy a hundred dollar pair of shoes and they get themselves a fancy jogging outfit and they map, a map out a three mile thing they're going to do and after the first or second day, forget it. And years later, the shoes and the jogging suit are there in the closet. Why? They didn't start out realistically. I can remember as my 40th birthday was approaching and I said, I can't live on borrowed past conditioning. I've got to start making conscience about daily exercise. I didn't start out by running two, three miles. I started out by running around my backyard. Now, I didn't see me running around my backyard said the poor man's crazy. Well, it wasn't long before the backyard, 16, 20 laps around that was boring. So then I started running seven-tenths of a mile, then a mile, mile and a half, two miles, until it got up to where I was running enough to accomplish the purposes of it. But I didn't, I had sense enough not to try to bite it off all at once. Well, it's the same way, even in recent days, brethren, as God has dealt with me, as I indicated last week, God has helped me to set some realistic goals, to push myself in this area where I've not pushed myself, and yet I've known enough of my past failures to set realistic goals, so that you can look back and say, by the grace of God, this week, X number of days of the week, I've accomplished my goals in intercession. And that gives you not only a sense of gratitude to God, but that nerves you to say, if God helped me, these days, God can help me rest, you see. And it's not that self-defeating cycle of unrealistic goals that come tromping down the back of your neck with the big hobnailed boots of guilt because of failure. And the failure is not just the aversion of your flesh and the powers of darkness, but setting unrealistic goals for yourself in this area. And then the third practical cause of failures and this is what I'm calling failure to constantly stir yourself up to greater efficiency in this exercise. And one of the texts that I've listed, Isaiah 64 and verse 7, is one of the saddest verses in, I think, all of the scriptures, where God waits to be desired and sought by his people. And yet this is what he says in Isaiah 64 and verse 7. There is none that calls upon your name that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hid your face from us and have consumed us by means of our iniquities. What a tragic thing that God has to say through the prophet, there is no one who stirs himself up to take hold of the living God. Here he stands ready to be taken hold of in prayer. And he says there's no one who will stir himself up to take hold of him. How often has God had to say that to me? If only I would stir myself up with appropriate thoughts of God's willingness and readiness to hear, the strategic place of prayer, what kinds of stumblings and failures and, and shameful lapses are in the people of God from this perspective as the living monument of my prayerlessness. And as a pastor, you've got to ask that knowing that God holds every believer accountable for what he does with his stock of grace. God will hold every believer accountable, but surely he holds us accountable, who are to pray and travail that Christ be formed in them. And when you see lapses in your people, you can't help but ask the question, is that lapse in spite of my fervent prayers for their growth in grace? Or is that lapse in part the result of my prayers. And I tell you, a few things are more convicting, brother. You see the question? Knowing they're fully accountable. It's one thing when someone lapses over whom you've labored in prayer. It doesn't make it any easier. It'll break your heart even more. As Paul could say several places in the epistles, brethren, I fear lest I've bestowed labor in vain. And that's a terrible thing to have a broken heart. You bestowed labor in prayer in vain as far as the present appearances. 
But that's far better than saying, could it be that that very lapse is the fruit of my not praying? And one of the ways that we do this is to stir ourselves up. I've listed 2 Peter 1.13, the whole concept of stirring up ourselves. Peter says, I tell you these things not only because you know them and are established in them, but I think it neat as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by way of remembrance. And I would urge you, brethren, to constantly seek to stir yourselves up by appropriate means to be diligent and to increase in consistency in the labor of ministerial intercession. Well then, let me very quickly, no, let's break here, and then we can take up specific suggestions with respect to overcoming these hindrances, and then the miscellaneous concerns of prayer in relationship to fasting and in relationship to your fellow elders. So let's take our ten minute break now and come back at quarter after, all right? Before you, the three categories of the hindrances to ministerial intercession, we come now in the fourth place to take up some specific suggestions with respect to overcoming the hindrances and gaining efficiency in prayer. And the first seems so obvious, but it is a matter again that we often lose the battle in the most obvious and basic issues, that we cry to God to make us mighty in prayer. You remember the incident in Luke chapter 11, that apparently the disciples either came upon our Lord as he was praying, or the Lord had drawn aside to pray, yet in close enough proximity that they could hear him in his prayers, and as they as it were, eavesdropped on the prayers of our Lord, it exposed their own deficiency in prayer, and so they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And then a fascinating thing, we wouldn't know from any other part in the Gospel records that one of the things John did with his disciples was to teach them to pray. So it's one of those little strokes that you have here. There's no record in the ministry of John. He was calling people to repentance, He was pointing to the Lamb of God, to the Son of God, John chapter 1. But here we see that he taught his disciples to pray, and so they cry out, Lord, teach us to pray. And surely that request is never out of place, nor is it ever treated with indifference by our Lord. When we're asking him to teach us to pray, to know how to wrestle with God in prayer, as he wrestled with the Father We are praying according to the will of God. We don't ever need to say, Lord, give me this if it be your will. This is one of the prayers that we can say, Lord, your will is made known in the scriptures. I plead with you, teach me to pray. And then secondly, allocate specific time for this exercise. And here we could bring many scriptures, but I just use as one in buttressing this very obvious matter, Daniel's experience as recorded in Daniel chapter 6. And verse 10, you remember that in that crisis that came with respect to the edict that was demanding that worship be given to the creature, which Daniel, as the true son of the covenant, would give to Jehovah alone, that in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10 we read, And when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, now his windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees, three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Here was a pattern of commitment to pray three times a day. I'm not saying that from this we deduce that we ought to have three times a day, but the principle is that the man of God, Daniel, did not wait for the inspiration of the moment to allocate time to pray. He worked it into his daily schedule with all of the responsibilities that were upon him so that in the crisis he's not scurrying about trying to make himself acquainted with the throne of grace. He's been there three times a day in days when there was no crisis so that in the crisis he just carries through and adds to whatever else he made the subject and the concerns of his prayers this that grows out of the present pressing set of circumstances. And then the obvious flip side of the hindrance of setting unrealistic goals, set realistic goals. Well, what are those goals? Only you can determine before God. And none of us has the same complex of everything from our our other responsibilities, domestically, personally, etc. But set realistic goals as you seek to plan out your days and your weeks before the eye of God. Set realistic goals for those 
specific times to give yourself to ministerial intercession. And then, fourth suggestion, meditate on suitable portions of the Word of God. Look to those portions of the Word of God where we see men at prayer. The three nines, never forget them, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. Three of the most helpful passages showing what's involved in earnest, fervent, intercessory prayer. Here again, I commend uh, for your constant and uh, careful perusal Donald Carson's book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation. Take the prayers of Paul as a pattern for your own prayers and to be stirred up to this duty. Meditate on the portions of the Word of God particularly suited to create impetus and give direction and encouragement. And then my fifth line of practical counsel is to read books calculated to move you in pursuit of this duty. Recently, when I was visiting my mother, she handed me uh, a copy of E.M. Bounds' Power Through Prayer that fell into my hands as an 18-year-old kid. And she rebound it. This is one of the ways she spends her time, finding paperback books that she can rebind with the shelf paper. And she does a pretty nice job with them. And she even re this and it was very moving to me, even lying in a hospital bed yesterday waiting for my colonoscopy to reread several of these chapters and to see the things I underlined as an 18-year-old boy. It was both encouraging, humbling, and convicting. Because to whom much is given, of him shall much be required. And to think that I read some of this stuff as an 18-year-old kid, and God's going to hold me accountable for that light and it was tremendously moving and I've determined to complete rereading it and uh, looking at my rather uh, non-neat markings all the way through it's brought back many memories of those early days but I'm sure it made a stamp upon my spirit that I've long since forgotten in terms of where the stamp came from but I urge you E.M. Bounds is not to be followed in his theological acumen at many points but in terms of a writer who is can be used of God to stir you up to pray. Uh, Palmer's work on the theology of prayer, uh, D.M. McIntyre's little work on prayer, Brooks, Volume 1, The Privy Key to Heaven, uh, the biographies of McShane and Payson and all of these others. The materials are there, brethren. Mm. But we need constantly to read those things that will stir us up. It's part of that stirring up ourselves to take hold of God. And few things will do it, like reading of someone who did find a good measure of liberty and efficiency at the throne of grace. So I leave these specific suggestions uh, with you and trust that God will be pleased to use at least some of them in your life, if not now, down the road as you find yourself in a position where some of these things will come back to you and you say, what can I do to be stirred up, to be more dedicated and given to this labor, God will use perhaps some of these means. Now then we come finally to miscellaneous concerns relative to the duty of ministerial prayer, and I want to address more uh, extensively the whole question of prayer in relationship to fasting, and then more briefly, prayer in intercessory prayer in relationship to your fellow elders. Now, it's not my purpose to give a general treatment on the subject of fasting as a religious exercise. Let me give you a little bibliography that will help you if you don't have at your fingertips a broad biblical overview. I commend for your careful reading the article in Zondervan's Pictorial Bible Dictionary on fasting. It's an excellent article, a little bit weak at the end, but as a basic overview of the biblical doctrine of fasting, it is helpful. The article in Baker's Dictionary of Theology. Again, very good. In my judgment, accurate, balanced. And then in A.W. Pink's exposition of the Sermon on the Mount, particularly his treatment of Matthew 6, 16 to 18. Excellent section. Likewise, Lloyd-Jones, on the same passage in his two-volume work on the Sermon on the Mount, And then pages 340 to 343 of Hendrickson's commentary on Matthew. Very helpful collation. As you know, at certain points, uh, Hendrickson will give you a, a digression in which he'll call a lot of biblical material under a given text that he's dealing with. And then, of course, Miller's little booklet on fasting by Presbyterian Heritage. 
Samuel Miller. It's just called Fasting. And then the chapter in Donald Whitney's book, I've listed that at the end of the lecture, uh, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. He has a chapter on fasting. All right, suffice it to say that here I'm using the word in these brief remarks referring to the partial or total abstinence from food and drink for the purpose of assisting us in unusual or protracted seasons of intercessory prayer. The partial or total abstinence from food and never total for long from drink for the purpose of assisting us in unusual or protracted seasons of prayer. So that I'm not thinking of fasting in any other relationship, but its relationship to and in conjunction with a season of intense commitment to pray, not only in general, but specifically what we're dealing with, ministerial prayer. And I've listed the basic heads of what I believe to be an accurate treatment of the subject of fasting. And first, there is sufficient biblical warrant to assert that fasting can be and in some circumstances ought to be a handmaiden to unusual seasons of ministerial prayer. Now, that's a mouthful, but again, in trying to be balanced, brethren, because here we're dealing with duty and conscience, and we must tread very carefully. There is sufficient biblical warrant to assert that fasting can be, and in some circumstances ought to be, a handmaiden to unusual seasons of ministerial prayer. When our Lord deals with the subject, it's very interesting, there are only two places of unquestioned textual certainty. As you go through all of the recorded statements of our Lord, there are two passages in which he addresses fasting with absolutely no question as to what he did say. In Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may be seen of men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that you may not be seen of men to fast, but of your father, I'm sorry, of your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret shall recompense you. Now you know what our Lord is doing here, that in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, he is focusing upon the perversions of certain religious disciplines that were manifested by the scribes and the Pharisees. First of all, he dealt with the matter of prayer, and he says, therefore, when, I'm sorry, when you do your alms, when you engage in acts of benevolence, verse 2, don't sound the trumpet before you. Then verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. And then in verse 16, when you fast. Assuming that the practice that the Pharisees had of their twice-a-week fast would to some degree be practiced among his own or could be practiced in the future, and so our Lord taking the occasion of correcting the abuses of giving, of praying, and of fasting manifested in the patterns of the Pharisees, assumes that his disciples in perpetuity will be engaged in the giving of alms, in praying, and in some degree of fasting, and so that's the major import of this particular passage. And then the other passage where it is indisputable that our Lord mentions fasting is in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15. Verses 14 and 15. They come questioning our Lord, why do we and the disciples, I'm sorry, why do we and the Pharisees often fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said unto them, Can the sons of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then will they fast. And here our Lord just makes a simple statement that fasting was not consistent with the presence of the Lord Jesus with his disciples. But a time was coming when he would leave them and the circumstances would be such that fasting would be in order under those altered circumstances. That's basically what he says. How much to fast, when to fast, there is no clear directive. Now, with respect to prayer, 
there is no question. Luke 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. But he never says men ought always to fast. When you fast, the days will come when they will fast. But you see, it's not in the same category of explicit duty as prayer. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Watch and pray. He doesn't say watch, fast and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The duty to pray is far more explicit, clear, and unmistakably repeated in the teaching of our Lord than is a duty to fast. And therefore to put them on the same level in my judgment is to disrupt the balance of Holy Scripture. In the epistles, there are only two references of indisputable textual nature, 2 Corinthians 6, 5 and 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. Now, Arndt and Gingrich put that fasting in the special category of circumstantial abstinence not necessarily connected with prayer. Now, I'm not prepared to do that, but I'm saying that some responsible handlers of the Word of God would do so. So when we take that and add to it that the examples that we have of fasting in the Scriptures, Luke 2, 37, we have the example of this godly woman who spent her time as a widow in prayer and fasting, Luke 2 and verse 47, I'm sorry, not verse 47, Luke 2 and verse 37, and she had been a widow even unto fourscore and four years who departed not for the temple worshipping with fastings and supplications night and day. The significant thing is here's a woman in a special condition of extended widowhood in a special ministry of prayer in the temple and she is found fasting in conjunction with prayer, fasting and supplication. Our Lord in the wilderness, Matthew 4 Verses 1 and 2, he was 40 days and 40 nights fasting. Acts 13, 2 and 3, as they're ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Spirit of God speaks, and then they pray and they send forth the servants of God in Acts 14, 23. When they appointed elders and had prayed with fasting, they commended to the, to the Lord on whom they believed. Now you've exhausted the significant New Testament data. Unless I've missed a major passage, we've exhausted the basic data of the New Testament. But taking the whole testimony of the Old and the New Testament, it is clear that there are times when fasting is found in a very natural way in conjunction with extended, concentrated, earnest seasons of prayer. Daniel 9 and verse 3. Daniel seeks the Lord how? Well, he tells us that this seeking of the Lord in this critical situation was a seeking of God. Verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Having come to understand that God had said that the captivity would last 70 years and concerned that in the outworking of those purposes of God there would be a moral congruity that there would be repentance leading to the favor of God that would bring about the restoration, Daniel sets himself to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting. And likewise in the call that goes out from the prophet Joel, there is impending judgment. God is going to send the army of the locusts. And now he says, yet even now turn unto me with fasting and mourning and weeping and rend your heart and not your garments. And then you have the incident in Acts chapter 9, verses 9 and 11, that indicate that in this situation where the Apostle Paul has been arrested by the risen Christ, he has gone without food. Verse 9, he was three days without sight and did neither eat or drink. Verse 11, the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas, for one named Saul, a man of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And I bring the two verses together to show that the fasting, though the word fasting is not used, what fasting is, is clearly described. He was three days without sight and did neither eat nor drink. Well, what's he doing? 
waiting to get into some more receptive spiritual frame in some Eastern mystic theology? No, he's praying. He's giving himself to this concentrated, intense season of prayer in the light of the great disruption that has come into his life by the grace of God. And similarly, with Acts 13, 2 and 3 and Acts 14, 23, the fasting is said to be in conjunction with prayer. Now, what can we say in the light of that biblical material? Well, I believe it is safe to say that if over a lengthy period precluding any serious physical condition that would not make it responsible to fast, If we do not find ourselves fasting, we are either ignorant of the place of fasting, indifferent to the benefit of fasting, or perhaps unwilling for the demands of fasting. And there I have to leave every man's conscience with God. I know some people that in my judgment it would be physically irresponsible for them to fast. They would be tempting God because of the physical conditions that they have. There are others and I'm pointing my finger at myself, that I believe at times the unwillingness or the disinclination to fast has been rooted in a kind of carnal indifference or an unwillingness for the demands that fasting may bring upon us. Beyond that, I'm not prepared to go to bind any man's conscience, but to say there is sufficient biblical warrant to assert that fasting can be, and in some circumstances ought to be, a handmaiden to unusual seasons of ministerial prayer. And what are those seasons for you? When it moves into the ought, only you and God will know. And I'm not prepared to be a lord over your conscience. And I would warn you about letting one else become a lord over your conscience. All right? second thing I want to say is that there is abundant biblical warrant to condemn as abominable in God's sight fasting that is mechanical, ascetic, ostentatious, legal, judgmental, or hypocritical. There's abundant biblical warrant to condemn fasting for wrong motives. There's the mechanical view. Remember Isaiah 58.3. Here they are. Living in all kinds of sin. Read Isaiah chapter 1 for a catalog of those sins. And yet they say to God, Wherefore have we fasted, they say, and you don't see? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge? We put the penny in the slot, God. How come we haven't hit the jackpot? It's a mechanical view of fasting. We do this, and then God obligates himself to bless us, regardless of our ethical and moral condition. And so God says to them, Behold, In the day of your fast, you find your own pleasure, exact your labors, you fast for strife, contention, etc. Here was a mechanical view of fasting. Similarly, in Zechariah 7, 4 to 7, you find similar language from the prophet Zechariah. But then there is not only what I've called mechanical view of fasting, there's the ascetic, which God flatly condemns in the scriptures. Colossians chapter 2. These people that came along with their Gnostic theology with that Gnosticism was a very strict regimen of self-denial. If you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to ordinances? Handle not, no taste, no touch, all which things are to perish with the using after the precepts and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and severity to the body, but are not of any value against the indulgence of the flesh. Mm -hmm. To fast from motives of asceticism, the notion that by beating down the body I'll beat down the flesh, Paul says, no, no, you will indeed cause people to be amazed at your great composure of your willpower and apparent brokenness and humility and severity to the body, but they are not of any value against the indulgence of the flesh. And then there's the ostentatious fasting of the Pharisees. They wanted to make it plain to everyone they were fasting. They put on their sourest face and let their stubble grow, and uh, you don't look too well today. Oh, no, I'm fasting. No, the Lord says, you ought to come out from the place where you've been praying and fasting. And people say, you just come back from vacation? Man, you've got a nice glow on your face. He said, put some oil on your face. Shave, put on some nice aftershave, put on your bright face. So only your father who sees in secret will know that you're fasting. Anything of ostentation. 
And the ostentation can be not only in physical appearance, but in dropping little hints. Well, I've just come off a three-day class. Blah, 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 blah. You know, look at me. You kill the nerve of any virtue before God when it becomes ostentatious. And then it can be legal and judgmental. You remember when the Pharisee is bragging to others? He's not talking to God. He's praying thus with himself. What becomes part of this legal, judgmental disposition that he has in the presence of God and in the presence of men? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you I'm not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, even as this public, in a heart full of judgmentalism because he doesn't know his own sin. I fast twice in the week. You see, it's part of that whole spirit. And I've seen that with people. You don't fast once a week? Look down the nose in judgmentalism. It's the spirit of the Pharisee. If God gives you grace to lay hold of him at the expense of normal patterns of eating and drinking, those kinds will be too sacred to prostitute them as any kind of a club with which to beat others or a platform on which to try to parade yourself before God. Legal and judgmental. And then, of course, hypocritical fasting is condemned. You go back to the Isaiah passage. Not only was there a mechanical view, wherefore have we fasted and you don't see us? There was the idea that by trying to impress God and others with their fasting, this could cover the wickedness for which God exposes them through the ministry of the prophet himself. So there is abundant biblical warrant to condemn fasting from any false and devious motive. And then the third statement that I've made is there is no biblical warrant to assert that regular fasting is a Christian duty in general or a ministerial duty in particular. That's the final, to me, balancing statement. There's no biblical warrant to assert that regular fasting, if you're to assert and to bind your own conscience and bind the conscience of others to regular fasting as a generic or specific ministerial duty, from what passages of the Word of God would you bind the conscience of people to regular fasting? I would be at a loss to come up with texts that could bind the conscience to regular fasting. Now that statement must be put against my second statement. Uh, the first, yeah, the second statement. There is uh, the first statement. There is sufficient warrant to assert that fasting can be, and in some circumstances ought to be, a handmaiden to unusual seasons of ministerial prayer. But to take that and say, therefore, you must at least once a month, you must at least once a week. I have real problems with that when it comes to the data of Holy Scripture. No biblical warrant to assert that regular fasting is a Christian duty in general or a ministerial duty in particular. And I think we'll have time to open that up for discussion. I don't claim infallibility in my judgment on the biblical materials, but as I've wrestled with them over the years and tried to state them, I feel comfortable with what I've put in your notes and what I've set before you. Self-denial and self-control are constant duties. I can prove that from the Bible. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9 and verse 23. I can bind my conscience and your conscience to daily cross-bearing and constant self-denial. I can bind your conscience to constant self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Now, insofar as self-denial and self-control mean that there are circumstances in your life in which you ought to fast, you better fast with your prayers but am I prepared to tell you from the Bible and if you do not join fasting to your prayer at least once a week you're sinning once a month you're sinning once a year you're sinning I can't do that I cannot go beyond the scriptures you say but that leaves me up in the air yes it does it leaves you up in the air with your Bible beneath your feet and the Holy Ghost and the Lord who's promised to be your shepherd and to lead you in paths of righteousness and we would all like to have it wrapped up a bit more neatly. I would love to have it. I believe if there was something in the Bible that said, thou shalt fast once a week, I'd buy my conscience to that and say, all right, Lord, then once a week I'll fast. Because some of us sort of live on a partial fast all the time anyway, just to keep our weight stable. We barely consume enough calories to keep ourselves alert. So, what's the big deal? But is my conscience thus bound as I stand before you? It is not and I've never been able to bind the conscience of another person. Self-control? Yes. Self-denial? Keeping under our body and and not letting its appetites get out of control? 1 Corinthians 9.27? Yes. 
But don't allow the self-indulgent spirit of the age to keep you from being open to those times when you ought to fast in conjunction with your praying. Now let me just say something briefly about pastoral intercessory prayer in relationship to your fellow elders. Certainly prayerfulness ought to mark your regular and extraordinary meetings with your fellow elders. Now here's where the circumstances will differ. If you have a fellow elder who is also set apart to labor in the word and in doctrine, then you ought to be able to find time to give yourself to intercessory prayer. Those have been very precious times in days past in my own experience when I've been able to pray with men who were also laboring full-time. But even if you're laboring with, quote, part-time lay elders, you must make your times of prayer central to your regular meetings in which you give yourself to praying for specific needs among the flock of God, specific individuals and concerns, so that you, as a body of overseers, can have a measure of a good conscience when you look into the faces of your people that you are giving yourself to prayer as well as to the ministry of the Word. Well, brethren, in conclusion, I trust that as we come, in a very real sense, to the end of the whole course in pastoral theology, this Unit 7 and Unit 8 deals with pastoral counseling, the individual care of the shepherd. I trust that each of you is determined by the grace of God to give due place to the nurture of your own walk with God, the constant development of your own mind, giving yourself to constantly seeking to be better preachers, better overseers. But may I urge you, above all else, that you seek, by the grace of God, to become mighty in prayer. And as these other desires are kept alive in your heart by the Spirit through the Word, they will find a God-honoring expression, in most cases in direct proportion to the maintenance of the spirit of prayer. If you become an effective preacher to become less of a wrestler with God, you'll be in a terribly dangerous place. You may mistake God's blessing on your preaching for God's approbation upon the entirety of your ministry. And to me, there's no greater curse. The ultimate expression of that is the many who will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he will say unto them, Depart from me, I never knew you. We need to load our consciences with Owen's insight that the best way to assure that all our other ministerial labors are born of a right motive is to have them all rooted in intercessory prayer for our people. Mm -hmm. Then we can have reason to believe that what we select and what we deliver in our public ministries is really born out of a genuine concern for their spiritual well-being. May the Lord help us, and may God help us as we pray for one another, as we pray that we may continue in the way of holiness and in the way of 